Are any J creatures in the room? Yay, there we go, we have a few, right? Okay, so as the hottest unconference on the planet, it's a, a conference that I co-founded with Heinz, Dr. Heinz Kibbutz. Anybody know Dr. Heinz Kibbutz? Everyone, yeah, he was supposed to be here next session, but because we were supposed to drive back to Athens together, but uh, apparently there's this thing called a air traffic controller strike. We have to do something, right? Can't we make that system like autonomous so that, yeah, never mind. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, t a guide to tuning G1GC. Um, as um, you may or may not know, um, actually, this is a good question here, right? Uh, how many people here are using JDK 10 or, I guess, 9 in their production environments? Hands up. <laughs> Hands up. Okay, in that case, I, I, I have to do this sometimes. Like, it was like at, uh, at a co conference in Tokyo just a week ago, and uh, the Japanese are very reserved. So the first thing I had to ask them is like, do your arms work? Prove it to me. Hands up. There. Yay. Lovely. Okay, and then it's okay. So now I can ask the question is, who's running JDK 10 in production? Okay, good. That's zero. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so JDK 8, I imagine most, 7, 7, yeah, okay. Um, so one of the things that's remained stable over the last number of years is the garbage collector that we use in our production systems. Whether you know it or not, the default collector has always been the parallel collector. And um, in the background, you know, some people will change to the mostly concurrent mark sweep collector, and that's been our world. And, you know, that was good for scalability up until about maybe, eh, you know, 8, 12, maybe 20 gigabyte heap sizes. As soon as you start getting beyond that, then we run into this problem of the dreadful stop the world pause. Who here loves the stop the world pause? Oh, we have, oh, great. You're my fans. I love you. There you go. Or sorry, I'm your fan, so it's, it's, it's good. So we'd love to stop the world plus. And, and we hear this, so I, so I want to correct something here, right? Who thinks that garbage collection interferes with your application's performance? In other words, it lowers throughput. Wrong, 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 wrong. Okay, so anybody have a date on when the first garbage collector was written? Just shout it out. 1960s? 5859, that's when it was first conceived. So it ends up in the list engine, released in 1960. So, yeah, almost right. Okay, so here's the overhead of a garbage collector in 19, 1960 list engine 40%. 40% overhead. And you might think, okay, that's crazy. Why would they put a garbage collector in an engine if it has a 40% overhead? And the answer is, even with the 40% overhead, they had higher overall application throughput. And you reduce the cognitive load on the programmers because they don't have to worry about data lifecycle management and all that stuff, right? So you sort of get this double hit and everything like that. Okay, so fast forward, we get into, well, here's, a good, here's an interesting question. Does anyone know what the recent memory management costs were in a C++ application? No idea, right? I'll give you a number, 20%. Does anyone know what the um, uh, overhead is of a well-tuned garbage collector in a Java virtual machine today? Hold up. 5%? That's an upper bound on the threshold. We usually like to get them around like 1% to 2% overhead, right? So. So, okay, so where is this pause time application throughput sort of um, thing come from? Well, it's, 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 not, it's not really that it affects application throughput. Actually, application throughput using a garbage collector tends to be much higher than if you don't use them. Um, the problem is it's a fight against tail latencies. Because every now and then, we have this damn stop the world pause where everything freezes while the JVM does some maintenance for us, cleaning up memory, right? 
So then we get these long tail latencies that are very annoying. And then everything runs along really hippity hop, right? So we get used to the hippity hop really fast and then bang, we get hit with another one. So really the war and what we're seeing in terms of garbage collection technology and especially what's coming up in the next couple of years is a war on the pause time to get these things to run more concurrently. And, and the war on the pause time is not to improve your application throughput, it's to help manage these long tail latencies that we see in, in um, the, you know, the randomly occurring long tail latencies in, in terms of our response times, right? Um, and, and, and so if you look at what's coming up, we have G1, GC, which um, you know, scales nicely, gets to much, much bigger heaps, but it still gives us really long pause times. Um, we have ZGC, we have, which is a new one from Oracle. We have Shenandoah coming on board. These are not production ready yet, but I think they're getting closer. Um, and, uh, you know, so, th and these reputedly are trying to do more stuff concurrently with your application. So the amount of work that they're doing in the pause is actually uh, less. So it's, it's really, we're battling, we're trying, there is this war on the pause time to try to reduce it. You're never going to be able to get it to zero using current technology because there's just some really hard things that you can't do without a pause. Like, uh, for instance, how do you tell if a weak reference is collectible or not in a concurrent environment? Yeah, think about that for a bit, <laughs> right? So, so, th so that's, that's really, you know, uh, one problem that we have. Okay, so we're, let's, uh, you know, it's this war on tail latencies. We also have huge, much, much bigger heaps. And this is where the G1 and ZGC and all these things are, are really, uh, they're designed to help us. Uh, they're designed to help us manage these much, much larger heaps. And everyone thought, okay, this technology is good enough so that in JDK9, instead of the parallel collector being our default collector, um, we now have um, G1 GC is going to be our default collector, which means that if you don't set your default collector in your production environment, um, then the behavior or application is simply going to change, simply because you now have a new default collector. Okay? Now it runs more concurrently with your application. If it runs more concurrently with your application, guess what it does? It slows down the throughput of your application. There's always a trade-off between, you know, work you give your mutator threads and work you give the cleaning threads. There's a balance. Nice balance. If you get a good balance, then you get short pause times and good throughput. If you get a bad balance, then you either get long pause times or you get poor throughput, one or the other. You know, pick your poison. Okay. Um, yeah, so the question is, you know, you're moving to a new collector. How do you tune it? There you go. Right? If you don't want to uh, set the size of max heap, then it defaults to a quarter physical RAM. And you set this magical, mystical thing called a pause time goal, um, which is 200 milliseconds by default. So you, don't, so you don't have to set anything, and this is how it's all going to work. And basically, you know, the G1 was designed to be friendly so you wouldn't have to tune it like you do CMS or, or, uh, or the parallel collector. And that's how you tune G1 GC. Any questions? <laughs> right. You don't believe that was the end, do you, right? <laughs> right, so, if only it were that easy. Um, so I have the, probably the distinction of uh, tuning several thousand JVMs now at this point. Uh, my boss gave a number like of 3,000 last year, uh, th th approximately 3,000 of tuning them to run G1 GC. And the question is like, you know, uh, how did we get to the point where we had to tune it? Well, it came down to like we had to start managing the pause times to get rid of these latency issues. And if you're going to tune this thing, unfortunately, you're going to have to have an idea about how it works, right? And, and, and so, um, have any of you tried tuning collectors before? Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, it can, it can be really challenging, especially to try to figure out what's going on. 
Um, so, oh, this is our marketing slide. So I'm supposed to show you this because Marchen, my, my boss, says to put this slide up. Read it quickly. We'll move on. Got it? Good. Cool. Um, <laughs> so, uh, now, what I'm going to try to do here is say that, you know, if we're going to tune it, what we need to do is, like, uh, build some models. If I want to understand something, I build some models. Why do I build models? Well, because it helps me avoid all of the complexities. That's the beauty of models, right? Unfortunately, the problem with models is that it helps you avoid all of the complexities. Um, so you have to be aware of that when you are making models. But what we want to do is develop cost models, because if we want to know what's going wrong, then we have to look at the cost model, to, uh, some cost model to help us understand what to do so that we can uh, correct for the problem at hand, right? So help us, models are going to help us understand things. So let's, as we're going through the presentation, just try to develop this idea of a cost model in your mind so you know what's going on. Um, so memory management, as I mentioned before, consists of allocators, mutators, and garbage collectors. And as I mentioned before, there's always this trade-off between allocation and collectors in terms of work balance. And in the G1, uh, you know, with the parallel collector, it's basically, you know, it's all on the collector. The mutators aren't doing much to help the collector. Uh, by the time we get to CMS, so the mostly concurrent mark soup collector, then you can see there's some cooperation between the mutator threads and the garbage collector to create some sort of balance to try to minimize pause times. And G1 is a continuation of that. Um, there's also some other things that we need to know about. And, um, and there's this notion of what I call um, in place versus evacuating collectors. So if we look at an in-place collector, we need a free list. That's going to tell us all the space that's free. And when we garbage click, basically what we're doing is we're managing the free list to basically take the unused memory and put it back on the free list so that um, everything is available for our application to use again, right? Because it's going to do the allocation directly from the free list. Um, an evacuation collection uh, means that we're going to take that space and we're going to move all of the live data from that space into another space. OK? So the cost model here is quite different. The cost model of the free list is, you know, it's going to be dictated by the amount of space we have to free. The evacuating collector, the cost model is going to be dominated by the amount of live data that we have. And we have this wonderful thing called a weak generational hypothesis. And what the weak generational hypothesis says is that data either survives for a very short period of time or it survives for a very long period of time. And uh, fortunately for Java, the vast majority of data, well, m for most O systems or most systems, the vast majority of data that we allocate uh, doesn't survive evacuation from the CPU. In other words, it's alive for like microseconds at a time. Um, which means that the evacuating collectors have been favored in Java for quite some time now because they give more favorable cost models. Okay? And so that's basically what we're going to discuss is um, in, when we look at how we structure the Java heap, we're going to, you know, uh, structure it in the case of G1 so that we can use evacuation techniques in young generation, which consists of our nursery and our survivor spaces, and our tenured space. So traditionally, young gen has been evacuating, tenured has been in place. With the G1, we're now going to come up with a strategy using this thing called regions in order to be able to have an evacuation collection also in tenured space. So it changes the cost model quite considerably over the older collectors. Um, so we need a whole bunch of things. So we have Java Heap, so we have regions, uh, mark sweep, copy. That's our evacuation, right? So we have a young generational collection just for young generational regions, for the nursery and for the survivor. Um, tenured mark, mixed collections, we'll talk about them. And some supporting data structures called C sets and uh, remembered sets and other things like that. So we'll, we'll introduce these things. So first off, okay. What we're going to do is, when we start up the JVM, we're going to reserve a chunk of memory that's max heap size, the minus MX size. 
And then we're going to allocate from that. And what we're going to do is we're going to allocate regions. And the regions are going to be a fixed size, either 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 megs in size. Depends on how the whole thing is configured. We're going to want approximately 2,056 of these. So you can go through the maths there and as, as an example for 10 gig heap, you know, what you're going to end up with. Okay. Next, all the regions are going to be put into a free list. Here's my wonderful animation for that. You can applaud now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's our free region list. And so now we're, we're going to use ergonomics to say how big is our, young, is our Eden space, our nursery. So it's just going to say that's how many regions that we have available to us. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a region from the free region list. We're going to tag it as being Eden. It can be tagged as either being Eden, Survivor, or uh, Tenured Space, or Humongous. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then I do my allocation in it, and I keep allocating, allocating, and grabbing from the free list until I've used up all of my regions. And then upon an allocation failure here, in other words, I, don't, I can't allocate anymore because I have no more regions to allocate into, what I'm going to do is I'm going to trigger a young uh, generational uh, collection. So with the young generational collection, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take all of the young generational regions and I'm going to put them into this thing called a C-set, a collection set. Now, ergonomics is actually going to build this C-set with these rules. One, I'm going to put in all of the young generational regions, and during a mix collection, I'm going to put in a set of tenured regions. You know, how many tenured regions? Well, we'll talk about that later, but that's going to be dictated by the pause time goal. That's when that net value is going to be used. So ergonomics is going to estimate how much it's going to cost to collect all this stuff figure out how much is left over, and if I have any uh, tenured regions to collect, it's also going to uh, put those into the C-set. And then we'll do a, a sweep on the C-set. Okay, so we have mark sweep copy. So it's a mixer, mixture of parallel and serial phases. So we're gonna place all of the young uh, gen regions into the C-set. We're gonna calculate a root set. So these are what are technically known as external pointers. So these are all the pointers to things that are outside you know, think of JNI, stacks. There's, we have a pointer on a stack pointing something into Eden. And of course, that's going to keep that data alive, right? So we're going to go around, scan for these places, get the, get the uh, root set, and then we're going to trace all of the pointers, and we're going to mark everything that we reach as live, and then we can immediately evacuate that into a new region in what we're going to call a survivor region, right? Um, Another name for the survivor region is, is the, the two space, because that's where we copy two. Then we're going to place all of the Eden regions back on the free list, and ergonomics is going to run again. It's going to recalculate the number of regions to allocate to Eden, and voila, we end up with something that looks like this. Okay, so what does it really look like? I'll show you that in a second. Sorry, first I should mention these two little nice little parameters down here. Um, so we don't want Eden to get too big, and we don't want to get too small, right? Um, so basically what we're doing is we're setting bounds on how elastic young generational space can be in this case, right? The default value is going to be 5%. As, as a tunable, quite often we find that's too small and that has ill effects later on. Um, so what we do is we sometimes bump that number up to make it slightly bigger. Okay, so this is what the heap really looks like. So you're gonna, so if you go out on the web and you read all these wonderful articles on how G1 works, and there's a number of really good ones out there. Some of them are a bit dated, but they're still quite okay. Um, what you're gonna find is these fancy charts of how heap is laid out. They're all lying to you, every single one. This is what it looks like. This is how we know this is what it looks like, because I have a project on GitHub to visualize data that we pull from live systems. And when you pull the data from live systems and draw it, that's what it actually looks like. Okay, so that's a representation. Okay? So what happens is that the data is, uh, is basically created in our nursery called Eden, and then on each subsequent collection, it's pushed up into, into survive region. 
when we pass this magical threshold called a tenuring threshold, then what's going to happen is that the data is going to be pushed up into a tenured region. And you can see the tenured regions are allocated from low memory to high, whereas the Eden regions are allocated from high memory to low. <clears throat> okay, and the survivor will be floating sometimes in the middle, and they'll all sandwich down on each other. Okay, now, remember this list? We had this list, right? It was like Mark Sweep, parallel, place on. Calculate a root set. That is a time complexity issue, okay? Because where are the GC roots for collecting a young generational space? Well, they're in the stack frames, they're JNI references, they're in the code cache, you know. So they're scattered all over the place, but they're also in tenured space. So if I have data in tenured space pointing to something in young, that's going to be a GC root for that object in young space which means I have to scan all of tenured space, which is like not good, right? That's where a time complexity issue comes into. So it's a scan for root now becomes linear to the size of tenured space. That was a bad bottleneck in CMS. We don't want to do that over again. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to introduce um, something else called a remembered set. And a remember set is a really fancy data structure. It's based on a, a sparse representation of a directed graph, um, something I think you need a PhD in mathematics to understand. Um, I don't have one of those, so I don't understand it. So I'm not going to try to explain it. Uh, what I can say about it is that what you end up here is that every time I have a reference from tenured space into young generational space, I'm going to record that value in this thing called the remembered set, okay? And I'm gonna have one remembered set for each region of tenured, um, right, attached to a young generational um, region. So that means I'm now putting some work on the mutators, because every time the mutator points to something in young gen, I have to update the remembered set. So, so, you look at it, most people were concerned about allocation rates. We're also concerned about mutation rates. So how often do you do pointer flipping or swizzling? Now, as it turns out, updating this R set, the data structure, is rather expensive. So rather than have the mutator thread do it, we're going to put it into this zonal queue. So what we're going to do is we're going to enqueue the information into this R set refinement queue. And the white area, which is, you know, don't bother doing anything, represents about 10% of your pause time goal, right? So this queue has to be empty before the garbage collector can run. So, the, so the, if, if there's stuff in there, the garbage collector is, needs to drain it. And we don't want to spend more than 10% of the pause time goal draining this particular queue. Um, once you start getting into the green zone, you can see that we start get, getting more and more aggressive trying to keep it, this queue empty or more close to empty till you get to the red zone, which means that our application threads are going to be captured to actually update the remembered set. And that's going to act as a form of back pressure. That's going to slow your application throughput down so that they, they can keep up with things. Okay? So that's the fundamentals in a nutshell of the young generational collection. Um, how do we collect tenured? Well, in tenured, what we're going to do is a concurrent mark. Okay? And that's all we're going to do is do a concurrent mark. The purpose of the concurrent mark is to calculate the liveliness, how much data is live in each region. And so you can see there's a number of stages here. The, the red ones are stop the world. There's still some stop the world work going on here. So you're going to get an initial mark, which is going to be piggybacked, on the on the, uh, piggybacked into a young generational collection. And then you're going to have some concurrent marking. You're going to have a remark, right? So the initial one gets you what's known as a snapshot at the beginning, which is basically this is what the world looks like right now. The remark says this is how the world changed between the initial mark and this point forward in time. And we try to fix things, do the reference processing, start doing the cleanup, right? You notice there's no sweep in here. In Young, we had mark and sweep, which is basically copy, 
uh, that doesn't exist in here. So, you know, so how do we get the data swept? Well, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to do this thing called a mixed collection, which means that we're going to add some of these uh, regions to the young generational collector, and the young generational collection is going to do the sweeping of the uh, tenured regions. So I have more graphics here for you. I, I spent a lot of time working on these, so <laughs> do be kind. Okay, um, here's my tenured regions. So you can see that the green bits is like how full they are. And so the first thing I need to do is I need to basically sort them. There we go, they're sorted. Now, those guys over there are free. They can go back on the free region list immediately. And when I hit this threshold here at 85%, those are too full. There's gonna be expensive to collect. Remember, in this world, the cost of the collection, the cost of evacuation is, uh, is linear to the amount of live data that you have, okay? So at 85%, we're gonna cut it off and say, yeah, only these regions are eligible for a collection. And so what we're going to do now is we're gonna break that up into um, hopefully eight mixed collections. And we're just gonna keep adding these regions to the CSET until we filled, up our, filled out our pause time goal. So, Ergonomics is going to come in here and help us rebuild the, uh, um, um, uh, the CSET. Okay, cool. Now let's say you have a one meg region and you allocate a two meg object. What happens? It doesn't fit, right? <clears throat> Which means we need something to manage that particular situation. Okay, so here's what a real heap looks like. Um, this is from a production environment, obviously. So, that, so, and you can see that I got the blue things there for tenured, and I have the yellow things for um, survivor, the two space, green for Eden. Um, and what we have are these red coral regions. And these are for what's known as humongous allocations. So anything that's greater than half the size of a region is gonna be considered a humongous allocation. So we have in the middle there these two free-floating coral spaces. Those are bigger than half the size of a region, but not bigger than the region. And if you look at the uh, other ones, you can see that those are much bigger than a single region. So in order to do this allocation, we have to find a contiguous, a a space, con uh, contiguous piece of space that's big enough to satisfy the allocation, right? So that's just uh, a normal situation. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's not a lot of holes in heap here, which means that we've actually had to dip in this case to reserve space. And reserve space is going to be the chunk between the tenured space and the young generational space. And that's really there. It's about 10% of heap, and that's there to try to prevent a full GC, right? So if I can dip into reserve space to satisfy the humongous allocation, then that's good. Um, if I can't, that means I need to run a full GC, which is uh, in nine single threaded and in 10 is parallel, but it doesn't matter if it's single parallel or whatever, multi-threaded, it's still going to be an experience that you don't want to experience. <laughs> right, it's gonna be one very, very long pause, parallel or not, okay? Um, you know, anyways, so it's, it's just gonna clean everything all in one shot. Now there's some interesting things you can tell about this heap if you look at it, uh, just by based on this, right? If you look at the upper parts, right? Those are probably caches. If you look at the lower parts, in this case, it's a large distributed system. There's about 1,500 JVMs in there, all offering different services. What do you think the lower humongous allocations are? I heard someone say Jison string. Awesome, yeah, okay. So that looks like serialization for communication between the servers. So by looking at this data, we can actually get some idea about what the application is up to and what it's doing. what I already said, more about reserve space. 
Ah, right. These are these are older slides. Uh, what I did was we <clears throat> actually this is an FX application, so I use CSS shading to actually represent the you know the blue light blue is like live versus not live in in terms of the uh, um, um, the spaces. But but basically what you can see is like the white stuff all the way down to the bottom. Those are tenured regions. So something has completely gone off here, right? Because the tenure has basically squished out the young generational space. And when the tenure squishes out the young generational space, well, there's, there's an indication here that this is, um, well, this is a funny situation, um, which I should address later. But this is a clear indication that maybe your heap isn't big enough to manage whatever this event is. Uh, there's also something else going on here, which if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss. Okay, so the question is, how do you get this data? How do you understand what's going on? Um, well, in this case, it's like, you know, how do I get a GC log? So, oops, sorry, this is, I thought I had the unified logging parameters in there, and I don't, but that's easy to find anyways. But the point is, there's a bunch of flags, you can set on the command line, and what's gonna happen is it's gonna collect data, and then you get these massive gigabyte log files that everybody enjoys reading, right? Who likes reading log files? Yay, we love log files, right, right. I like reading log files also. <laughs> so, um, right, so, you know, if you want to know what's, why your pawns is taking so long, then you need to look in the log file and figure out what the garbage collector is doing, right? Because if you have a long pause, that means the garbage collector is taking a long time to do something. So we need to figure out what is it taking a long time to do. In that case, we're going to resort to some tooling which I'll start up. I'll use an older version. Maybe I'll share my screen so everybody else, I'll share. So you can see instead of just having me talk about it, right? Okay, so I wrote this tool because I got kind of frustrated with not being able to see what I wanted to see in the log files. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Whoop! And see, I just made it bigger again. Here, how's that? You can see in the back, awesome. Do I need bigger? I can do that. Where is it? Grab it like that, make it square a bit, put it in the middle, cursor, and yeah. Okay, these accessibility options are fantastic. Um, uh, okay, so, um, so basically what we do is we suck the log in, and I start actually looking for features in the log file that are hard to find. Like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, here we are. Uh, those are easy to find, sorry. Um, high pause times. So this had a 27 second pause time, which is like kind of ugly. We didn't have, this is something that people commonly miss. Uh, I didn't talk about Metaspace here, but um, Metaspace can cause, uh, can trigger GCs. Uh, there's, there's, oh, here's some other funky thing down here called high kernel times. And in this case, um, GC threads collected an abnormal amount of kernel time, 206 times. So uh, this is an interesting analytic because we actually use this to diagnose uh, incorrectly configured cloud environments and other things that you wouldn't think of, right? So, so the question is, what's going on here, right? So we have a GC thread running. It's running in user space, yeah? When should it be collecting kernel time? Yes, sir. During swapping? No. The correct answer is never. It's a thread running in user space, right? What's it doing down in the kernel? Okay, I lie a bit. It does do a little bit of kernel work in the terms that it actually will write a log, write data down the log file, right? So this is actually a symptom of the thread being hung up in the kernel space trying to, it, basically, in, you know, trying to write data down to disk. So this is what I call an equal opportunity performance killer. It's just not killing the garbage collector, it's killing the performance of your entire system. Right? It's just here we have the data that has the evidence that it's happening. So, so we get this sometimes. People will send us a GC log and say, man, we got these like really long garbage uh, collection times. And we look at it and say, 
you know, what's wrong with our garbage collector configuration? And you look at it and say, there's nothing wrong with your garbage collector configuration. You need to go and tune your operating system or we need to do something down in that layer and, and figure out what's going on. In other words, don't waste your time here. Go look someplace else. Um, yeah, so, and there's all kinds of strange conditions you can get. Like if you get like uh, garbage collector threads interfered with so they're not running, then all of a sudden our wall clock time is greater than our user time and kernel time together. So if our wall clock time is greater than our user time and kernel time combined, that means something stopped your garbage collection threads from running, yeah? So that's outside interference from your environment. So you need to go and find that culprit and try to figure out what's going on. So this is sort of like an aside that you can get from all of this, right? And, and if you want to look at the supporting data, let's go down here. CPU summary. Okay, we can all see where the problems are in this data, right? Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's blatantly obvious. Uh, this is why we use analytics, right? Because even, even if you see the problem, you don't, you know, it's okay. Exactly. Where is it? Who knows? Uh, I guess it's probably, well, here's one here. Hey, I found one. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, right. So, okay, so that's an aside. So, so we look at this thing here and we say, okay, so heap's pretty stable. Life is really good, right? So if I want to see, like, you know, what my live data set size is, well, it's that box here the area under this thing here. That's my live data set size, right? Every, everything else is like, ooh, that's pretty. Not, everything else is noise, um, except for like, what's that? <laughs> this is the occupancy of the heap after the collection. If that's the occupancy he of the heap after the collection, our collector didn't really collect all that much, did it? Not much collection going on here. So this is quite, and then basically this gets really even stranger because we end up with a full GC and after the full GC, our occupancy is all the way down there. So something, somebody, something somewhere, somebody wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing because you shouldn't see that. Um, this is a strange uh, anomaly we see in the, in the JVM sometimes. Uh, the solution to this is actually just give, the, give it more heap. Uh, the better solution is uh, we're convincing the JVM team they have a problem um, processing reference types. And if you, get in, you can get the system into this state where all of a sudden reference types will collect and then it will go whoomp. And then when you get a full GC, of course, all the references will um, be cleaned out. Um, I tend to like to look at things like this. So this is a memory pool sizes, like uh, young and tenured. It's not exactly correct. It's an estimation. Uh, but it gives you an idea of what the behavior is in terms of resizing. And sometimes you can settle things down in terms of try to resizing. So you can see uh, here, in this case, we never really go below 15%. Like that seems to be a, a preset value. Um, Possibly, I don't remember. I actually, I know where this log came from, but I don't know the exact scenario. I, I have thousands of, upon tens of thousands of logs, so um, I collect them as a hobby, and apparently I have a huge collection. So it's really kind of fun. Uh, here's another thing here. This is a nice magic number. Now, you can look at allocation rates, and I, I probably should put another slide in for allocation rates, but you can think of it, in its effect on performance is sort of like a power curve like this. And where the knee is, is about one gig to about 300 megabytes, with about 500 megabytes being centroid or whatever like that. So what we see is huge improvements in performance if we go from one gig, from anything, of, if we can reduce allocation rates from anything above one gig down to below one gig, then you hit the curve. And by the time you get to about 300 megabytes per second allocation, um, you can work to get it lower, but basically not as much bang for the buck. So this is where allocation rates become important. And I'll, and I'll give you an idea of how important this is. Um, oh, well, sorry, the, one of the authors of this wonderful paper is sitting right in the front row. Um, uh, and I don't know if I have time to go through the entire story. Actually, I don't, but, um, uh, but the point is, is that um, the monitoring that we have is all biased. It's fighting yesterday's battles, right? So we find a problem, what do we do? We fix it, then we instrument the area so that it never happens again. And if it does happen to happen again magically, then we will know because the instrumentation will tell us, right? 
Um, and that creates a huge bias in all of our measurements. So just about, I would say, about 100% of, or close to 100%, of our uh, performance monitoring APM tooling has a huge bias built into it. And so what we tend to find is performance issues are uh, things that are resulting of this bias. And you know you have a bias because if you have a performance issue and you fix it and you get a magical like two to three, maybe even five, wow, maybe it's wonderful, a 10% improvement in, in performance, you're going like, yeah, that's a win, right? And in my case, that's, no, you actually haven't found the right bottleneck. Here's a win, okay? A win is, um, I went working with a team uh, who had um, been using execution profiling and they took their transactional rate from like 100,000 TPS to 400,000 TPS. Sounds good, yeah? Sounds brilliant. They also had a 1.8 gig allocation rate. We reduced that to basically below 100 megabytes per second. We took the uh, throughput from 400,000 TPS to 25 million TPS. That's finding the real bottleneck. And my estimation is that 70% of the applications, you, know, so you can give an idea, so if we put this in a quarter, with more density here. I would say that, okay, you guys, your apps, they don't suffer from memory allocation issues, but yours do, yours do, and yours do, to put that in perspective, okay? Why do we not know about this? Because of all of the biases in our measurements, <laughs> okay? That's our allocation rate right here. That's an estimation of the allocation rate, I said. So again, we can look at this and say, do we need to tune the garbage collector? Or do we need to make our application more memory efficient? So this is a decision point right here, and we can use this data to actually make that decision. Okay? Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things you can do. Um, if we go into the phases, you can see there's a bunch of other phases, not so interesting. Here we are. Um, this blue bit up here is the parallel phase, so it's basically cool. Parallel phase is dominating our time budget. Excellent. And if I look at the parallel phases, ooh, it's messy. In a well-tuned G1, object copy cost should dominate the, perf the, 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 late, you know, the pause time budget. In this case, they don't. We've got some messy stuff going on here, so update remembered set. Generally, a uh, symptom of, uh, sorry, again, uh, high mutation rates. And we see some object copy domination up here, but really, that line should be really distinct and everything else should really be in the floor. Um, that means that we have some work here with our set refinement that we, that we need to tune. Um, if we look at the other phases, you can see that uh, the yellow bits up here are reference processing. By default, we have single threaded reference processing. What we really want, in most cases, is parallel reference processing. Um, so in this case, we just want to make sure that we actually have the parallel reference processing flag turned on, and that will magically take that yellow bit and drop it into the floor, right? Into, into the noise floor. So that, so that won't become a problem, sorry. But that, this is going to be a small win. This is going to be a huge win. So if I had to focus efforts, I'm focused it in this direction. I mean, that's just a, this is just a flag, so it's really, yeah, not really anything that's too dramatic. You can just set a flag and you're, and you're basically done. Um, and, and you can see there's a whole bunch of other different things that we can pull out of the data. Well, here's some idea about what's happening in reference counting. It looks like... There's not a lot of reference counting activity. The JVM guys use a benchmark that works at about 25,000 references per second. Um, so that's their threshold. That's, that was good for like 1996 or 97. Uh, today's applications generally go about 250,000 to half a million references per second. That's when the parallelization really is going to work very nicely. Okay. Um, GC causes, you can see in here, whoops, sorry, yeah. what happened? Bring that back to me. You can see the red bits here. Um, 
sorry, the guide went away. These are humongous allocations. So if you actually have a lot of collections as a result of humongous allocations, then of course that's a sign that you might want to take corrective action inside your application uh, to try to sort through this. The other way of doing this is by configuration is making a bigger reserve space, right? So you, th you can think of like the, hum the garbage collections due to humongous allocations are basically, these are uh, collection cycles that you can probably delay. They don't need to happen now. Okay, the only reason they need to happen now is I just didn't have a contigu enough, contiguous an space to do the perform the allocation. Um, and I think I'm just going to not mention this, but this is basically uh, a number of charts that you can read of that describe how the data is flowing through the survivor spaces. Uh, generally, this is interesting when we want to uh, try to set limits on these sizes. Um, Certainly, this is giving us an indication here of what our tenuring threshold should be. So you can see this is the tail, ed tail edge of the weak generational hypothesis, and you can see that you know, up to age about five, we get like huge recovery, and after age six, seven, or whatever, we're not getting any recovery. So in the normal course of things, I could set my tenuring threshold to get huge recovery and avoid copy cost, right? So everything to the left, Recovery, everything to the right, copy cost. Right, three minutes. So it's, it's a bit, to, bit of a tour through the tooling that can actually give you what useful information there is. I mean, you can, uh, uh, there's other tools you can use uh, aside from this one, but um, this tooling here, uh, well, any of the tooling, any, any, t any time you're going to write some tools to look at uh, log and do some visualization of the logs, it's going to give you information that um, you're probably not going to see unless you do some visualizations. There's still some visualizations where you're not going to be able to see things, and that's where analytics really come into play. They're going to help you to see things that are pretty much hard to see. Okay, so I mentioned that we should have object copy costs dominating the performance picture. Um, and if you have that, then there's really not much you can do about, uh, about it, right? If you need to reduce your pause time, we need to start figuring out, okay, how, how are we gonna manage that? Um, well, if you wanna look at overhead and throughput, um, the only way that I've found to m minimize the effect of object, co uh, object copy costs is to reduce the frequency of collection. Now, here's the weak generational hypothesis. Right? It's a nice curve that basically says, this is how my data is going to live, uh, how long it's going to live in heap. And uh, you can see it lives for a very short period of time or it lives for a long time. So most applications have this behavior. Okay? Now, it's a curve. Since it's a curve, we can do some calculus. And we do some calculus on it, we get the area under the curve. The area under the curve represents what I would call the live data set size. And what the weak generational hypothesis says is that the live data set size is constant, right? Which makes sense, because if it wasn't, we'd be going up in memory until we run out of memory. We don't have any more, okay? Well, in reality, it has some variability over time, right? But it's approximately constant, which means the pause times produced by the G1 collector should be approximately constant. And if we go back to Sensum and look at the pause time graph, you could see with that particular graph, that's exactly what you see. The pause times for the young generation of collections are approximately constant. So what's interesting is that it doesn't matter how big we make the space, since the model says it's the volume of data that's going to control the pause time, we can make the heap bigger and we don't affect the pause time. Okay? Which sounds counterintuitive, but remember the model is it's the amount of live data that's controlling the pause time, not the size of heap. But if we make the heap bigger and our allocation re rate, rates remain the same, that means we decrease the frequency at which we trigger the collector, which means that 
instead of copying all of this data once per second, maybe we're copying it twice per se uh, sorry, once every two seconds. And so overall, that's going to reduce the cost of the collection. Right. So um, that's about all I have to, that's all the time I have. I don't actually have any more time. If you have any questions, you can come to me up here. I'll answer them. Um, normally, I like to leave more time for collections, but uh, for questions, but that's it. Um, if you're interested in um, uh, this particular tooling, send me email or tweet with that stuff in it, and we'll get a, get some licensing for you. And um, pretty much, I'm done. Thank you very much for listening.